Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for May 22nd, 2013. I'm Matt Gradwall from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com or on Twitter at uppercutwood. Uh, if you are watching the video but you want to jump into the chat, head over to uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chat room and uh, log in with your Twitter account and you are in Wood Chat. Um, with me tonight, as always, is guest host Chris Wong. Hey, Chris. Hey, Matt. How's it going? It's going pretty good. It's been a busy couple days, but other than that, things are good. You know what I see in your in your picture that I don't usually see? Hmm. I see daylight. Yeah, daylight. Yeah, it is. Uh, nice, isn't it? Well, kind of. I mean, the, if you could see what was on the windows, you'd see rain. So. Oh, really? Okay. I've got some yeah. nice weather here. Yeah, well, it's going to be nice this weekend, so, so I'm going to enjoy that. I'm going to go to Eastern Washington where it'll be 80 degrees and the beer will be cold. So, sounds nice. Um, so, what are we talking about tonight? Tonight's Design Jam Part Two, right? Part Two, yes. Um, so, I thought I saw on the invite for this event that Andy Brownell posted that he had recently finished a bench design. But what else is in the queue to take a look at? Um, I've got the project that I had from last week to share. And cool. I think you had something as well, right? Uh, well, let's save that for last or never. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, then. So why it's, don't just we a, it's a very, very minor update to that sewing cabinet sketch up that I showed a while ago, um, which okay. isn't, really, right. isn't really that interesting. So. Can't hear you. Can't, there you are. Now you're back. You lost your audio there for a second. Oh, I was typing in Twitter, and I think it mutes my, my computer. Uh, as soon as you type so, it, yeah, that's the new Google yes. Plus feature. As soon as you type it, mutes you. So. Okay. Uh, st stop typing, and I'm now sharing my screen here. So, I see it. It's good. Yes, that's a, that's a knot. Beautiful knot. So this is a table that I built uh, as a commission. I finished it up uh, last... Wednesday, just before wood chat, about uh, six hours before wood chat. It is uh, butternut. It's got uh, live edges on the front and the back of the tabletop, and one large knot in the middle there, which I think is just awesome. The figure around it is beautiful. Uh, the two it's ends I sculpted. It's a three-legged table. Three-legged table, yeah. Okay. It's got a shelf in the bottom and then three curved legs, all the same profile. And I'll scroll down. I dropped a link into Twitter, too. So if you're watching the Twitter stream with the hashtag WoodChat, you can have a look at the pictures yourself, too, and blow up whichever one you like. So um, comments or critique or anything welcome? It reminds me of the link I'm about to post in WoodChat. All right. It's got a bit of an iron stain on the left corner here on the, uh, I guess it's actually the right front leg of the table, but on the left side of the picture, that dark, that bluish gray stain. Was that stored outside, that wood? Um, or where did the stain come from? Is no. Um, it probably came from a nail that was in the tree at one time. Gotcha. And you just decided to leave it because it's uh, it's just actually pretty cool the way it streaks up on the inside of that leg. Yeah, I, I liked I liked it. Yeah. Um. So the front and back are live edges with the bark removed, and then the sides are curves you did yourself. Correct. That kind of match, kind of match that live edge a little bit. They do. They actually match the bevel of the live edge at that point. So, um, that live that this curved end actually twists. It's more vertical at the back and then more closer to 45 at the front. And you can see in the front right corner of this picture, it's very close to perpendicular. But if I go back a picture here, you can see that it's at a 45-degree angle. So that one changes a little bit over that length. You can see it right here. And did you spoke shave so that one in? One of the things I'm really happy with is how... Um, it was a lot. It would have been a lot. It's a lot of material to remove, so I used an angle grinder, and then I finished with uh, a block plane and then a random orbit sander. Spokeshave would have been gotcha. a lot of work, especially on end grain. 
So what, one of the things I'm really happy with uh, about the table is how all the joinery disappear, disappeared. You don't see any of it. Um, you see some of it if you look closely, if you know where to look, well, under the table. It's only about 24 inches high, so it's quite low to the ground. Okay. It's a, a bedside table. Am I confused as a stool? It, it's a bedside table. Okay. So, yeah, it's still so talk to me about how you attach that top. So I've got this three-armed uh, joinery system here, I guess we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And it's three pieces of wood, obviously, here. And what I've done is I've cut a dovetail into the end of each piece. And okay. I cut uh, a dovetail recess into the top of each leg. And I slid those in. And I use those to locate the legs on the bottom of the table where I wanted them to be positioned. And then I marked where they would overlap and join in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I cut the, cut the joints for that, and I pegged it with the dowel just to hold them in place as well. So mm -hmm. they're glued and doweled at the center. And then the holes are over, the holes in the arms are oversized, and that's why you have the washer to allow for right. wood movement. Right, they're elongated with uh, three sixteenth fender washers and number eight wood screws. Gotcha. That's how I built that, and the shelf you can't see any um, anything in there. You, you can't tell how it's mounted. It's actually on floating tenons. So uh, that was a little bit of a trick um, to get them completely concealed, but I, I managed to do that. And it's got a live edge along the front as well, um, mm -hmm. on the underside. So you do you have make, a detail of how you that shelf? Um, I don't think I do. I was okay. just flying at full speed here, and uh, yeah, took took me only maybe uh, two days to do this table. Gotcha. No twists so in the legs. No twists in the legs, but twists in the tabletop, in the ends yeah. of the tabletop. How was the butternut to work? I've never worked with butternut. Oh, it is beautiful. That's it's, right. um, it's kind of like walnut. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit softer than walnut. It's um, similar in hardness, a little bit softer. Yeah. And very smooth, very nice to work. Cool. Different color, obviously, than walnut, too. So that is the big one that I wanted to share with you guys last week. Um, I've got a couple other projects on my temporary workbench right now I can show you guys. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's see if I can turn the computer, turn the camera here. Let's close that and okay. So I'll bring the microphone with me. So I think you let me move my mic stand around. The video keeps cutting out, so I actually can't see what's going on right now. Okay. You can't see the video right now? No, um, it looks like it's showing up in the uh, feed though, so it's just my just my hangout. Okay. But Jim, okay. Jim's, have, Jim's having a problem with it as well, so. Okay. Hmm. Um, I can take a picture. I think I've got some pictures up already from earlier. I was posting some. Um, nice, Mike. Yeah. Mike says, I finally got it. Got the video to stay up after, after I kicked my son off Xbox Live. <laughs> uh. Okay, let's see. Where can I find those pictures? Um, So this is a, a table, and if I get my stick right here, this is a, a maple table base, and I can use my my stick here to poke the lazy Susan. Okay. Like that. So this this table is made from a slab which was uh, considerably tapered over the length. It was about um, 
two inches, two and a quarter inches at the thick end. Mm -hmm. And when it was milled with an Alaskan mill, the mill slipped, or the bar slipped, and it ended up being about three quarter of an inch, uh, seven eighths of an inch at the end, over about a six foot length. So it was severely tapered. And um, I got it for free because hey, what are you going to do with a piece of wood like that? So I was, I had it sitting around for about two, about three years, maybe more than three years. And I, I just had had no idea what to do with it. Um, for, for a while, I was thinking of cutting it for firewood, but because I didn't want to thickness it down to the three-quarter inch uniform, mm -hmm. take off an inch and a quarter in some parts, that'd be a lot of work. It's obviously too big to go through my planer, so um, I just held on to it for a long while. And um, this is what I finally came up with. This was, this was an idea I had about uh, about a month ago to build it into a T form. So the worst part of the taper is in this part here, this, uh, the long section that's uh, perpendicular to the camera, that's facing the camera right now. Mm -hmm. So at at uh, this end here, it's really it's about two and a quarter, two and a half inches thick, and over here it's about three quarters of an inch thick where it joins the other upright. Mm -hmm. are, those dom of, are those dominoes sticking out? No, uh, on the bottom, maybe. On that, um, on that, it looks like there's dominoes sticking out of the live edge. No, no, there isn't. Um, uh, can't, I'm not sure what you see. Um, there's a sliding tenon, a tapered sliding tenon that joins the one piece with the second piece, and that's the only joint in the piece. Okay, so rotate it to we'll rotate it counterclockwise again. Same direction. Counterclockwise. Other direction. Other yeah, that way. Push it that way. Keep going. I, I can't see, but I was looking okay. at the short vertical piece. Okay. There's two things sticking out. Uh, I don't know if it's just oh, okay. knobs or... At the bottom here, there are two, um, just two stickers I have it on that's I'm finishing it just to keep it off the, off the plywood bottom. I wish my video would work because I would be able to explain what I was looking at. Or I wish I could just rotate that thing. These sticks at the bottom here are just stickers for finishing right below the table. Um, and then it's just got some, some of the live edge here. So that is going to receive a glass uh, top. It's the live edge. It looks like there's knobs okay. that stick out of that live edge on that looking, smaller version. Looking at these two here. So the distance across the top is about 40, 41 inches, and it's going to receive a glass top, likely about um, probably 60, 66 inches. I think is the piece that I have picked okay. out. So it'll have a, it'll have a um, about two feet of overhang in this orientation. But here's another possibility. Let me show you this here. Hang on a second. Those knobs. So as you may know, I like turning things upside down. And that's exactly what I did here. When I was finishing it, I got the idea, hey, I could turn it upside down and put the glass this way too. So in this case, because of the shape of this longer piece, it means that the glass gets more support farther out and it, the table gets a wider footprint um, mm -hmm. for, for the, to support the glass. So this is another option. It also um, features the live edge uh, here a little better. Yeah. Because it's not on the underside. 
Um, I'm not sure which way I want to go. I could go either way here. See that I've cut a curve on the underside of the shorter piece. Mm -hmm. And that would be fine too. That'd be three points of stability for the glass. I'd get a, a much larger uh, surface for registration for the floor. But yeah. I think it re really could be used either way. Yeah, the, you're going to want to go with some pretty thick, pretty thick tempered glass. Yeah, I think I've got some half inch, half inch stuff. Weighs 120 pounds. This this sheet that I've got. And then you would you have it like cut it and have the edges ground and then uh, have it tempered? Yes. Yeah. I've al I've already got the piece. Um, it was actually a miscut from the glass shop, and I gave it to a friend of mine. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And then he gave it to you. Yeah. Yay. So that's the story for this table here. So what finish are you going to use on that? I've got um, general um, general enduro bar on here. Okay, so you're going to use a film finish. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But no tinting. You're not going to color the wood. No, it's actually it actually already has finish on it. I just need to rub out the finish. Okay. Um, of course, the water-based finish will raise the grain a little. I need to knock that down, and then apply one more coat. And that'll be it. Yeah. Now you left the bark on on that on that one live edge. Actually, I did not. Nope. There's no bark there. That's just the coloration. That's just the coloration. It's pretty cool. It is. It's amazing. How big is your planer? <laughs> My power planer. Yeah. 13 inches. Okay. Yeah, those slabs won't go through. No. Um, these are small slabs anyways. Even if I had a 24-inch planer, I'd still be constantly um, trying to do things that don't fit through. Yeah. So uh, a 48 would be nice. A 48-inch planer? Yeah, you're not going to get that in that in that shop. Um, it'd be my bench, which isn't a bad idea, actually. That could work. You you, you might enough. not have the right concrete. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. And you might not have the right electrical. Forty-eight inch planer is probably three phase at least, right? Yeah. Yeah, at least three. Yeah, three sets of pedals on that one. Yeah. So the idea is that the uh, glass goes across there. It's right side up right now, right? <laughs> could be. It might not be. I don't. This is, this is the, I think, the I think that, debate. I think that should be right side up. I like the idea of people yeah. being the live edge. I think so, too. Um, to help it sit flat, have you thought of cutting curves into the bottom of those pieces? No, I don't think it's necessary. Um, that part is flat, but of course, if something could high ground it very easily. Um, I think if I add... Or something? Yeah, little, little feet or felt pads. Felt pads, yeah. Um, Three points. That would be all that it needs. So you guys can't really see it, but um, the bench that it's sitting on is actually another slab. Um, this is a eight foot elm slab it's sitting on, uh, and you might have seen pictures on it of it on Twitter earlier. Uh, this is a commission a, a commission for another job. It'll be a dining table top once it's done. So. With this project, my work is to uh, fill the voids with a po with epoxy resin, and then level it. And I've got another table behind me here too. Um, I don't know if I can turn this one. I can't turn, but I can pick up the camera. I think. Let's see if I can just uh, disconnecting all the wires. So for this one here, turn the mic towards my mouth here. So for this one, I've got two slabs. Um, I had to cut a 45 degree bevel on each of them. Mm -hmm. uh, How did you cut the bevel? Hand? That was a trick. Um, yeah. There was. A, um, I ended up using a router for the first one and a and a sled mounted or a platform mounted at 45 degrees with the router to guide it. Mm -hmm. And I went back and forth with the router, then I finished it with a hand plane. 
Yeah. The second one, I just took to the table saw, and I cut. I set it to maximum depth. I cut it as far as I could. Then I finished with a handsaw and a hand plane. Um, these are about two and three quarter inch thick slabs, or I think one's actually even three and a half inches. So the bevels are about five or six inches long, at forty five degrees. And then how are those joined? With glue, with screws, with dominoes? Um, right now they're just clamped. Yeah. How will you, How um, will you do it? That's a good question, Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm still working on that part. So, I've got a few options. Um, dominoes did cross my mind. That's not a bad option. That'd yeah. be pretty uh, secure. It'd be fairly easy to do. Um, Would there be a way to put in a giant... Um, Loose dovetail key. I just thought of that. Yeah, that, I, I beat you to it. Yeah, you did. That that could work. Um, because of the angle, I could put it in the surface, and it would keep it from wanting to pull apart. I could mm -hmm. just put it right in the surface of the table. It's upside down right now, mm -hmm. and that would work because the forces from applied to the leg are trying to uh, lever off the underside of the table and pull the top of the table apart. Mm -hmm. So that, that would work. And then I could just glue cool. it. That would be very cool. Oh, I like that, Matt. Yes, that's why I like these design jams here. Now, what is the species of that of those slabs? This is also maple. Okay. So what wood would you choose then for a nice for a big key. dovetail? I don't know. Um, I'll have to turn over probably and have a look at it. Um, probably something uh, fairly sharply contrasting. Uh, yeah, good. Maybe depending on how dark the maple is. It's like yeah. a medium, medium western maple color. Um, holly might look good. A really white wood, or a really dark wood. Um, I don't have any ebony, but something really dark. Or else, maybe even half and half. I'm thinking of a, of a half white, half black dovetail or something. What if you had a um, a really nice piece? It might be too soft, of like a really clear, straight grained fir. Hmm. No. I think that would be too soft. Um, yeah. Although, if I epoxy it in, I can use. That, that epoxy will sink into the fur. It'll make it hard anyhow. That that could work. Um, I've got some fairly hard fur though. Actually, some some old old growth fur that's very strong. Um, that could work. That would be very cool. I mean, ebony would be awesome, but that would be like two hundred dollars with ebony or something. I've got licked him. There you go. I don't know if you guys saw my lignum stash. I got a few hundred pounds of lignum from from, an, from a carver who passed away. How many pounds? Uh, a few. Well, that that sounds like it works. Yeah. To make a a plane with it, actually, I want to make a a long plane, maybe a a two foot plane with the laid uh, right in the middle of it. Yeah. That way I can use it on, on guide. I have a, one guide set here, one guide here, and I put my material in the middle. And I can run the plane over those two guides and cut it in the middle to bring the surface in between level with those mm -hmm. uh, guides. Mm -hmm. That's my idea. Anyhow. Well, I, like, I, think it's a, I think it's a good idea to do that. Yeah, okay. The tail key with lignum, you think? Well, I'm not... Um, I would want, like I, like you said. I think you should turn it over and look part of the wood and pick something. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's all I have for projects to show today. Um, I believe that Matt's got something to. He's got a little uh, an update for us, right? Well, we'll. See. I'm trying to find the file. I didn't. I didn't do wood chat at home tonight, so we'll we'll see. Um, 
Andy has updated his bench. Yes, I saw, I saw that. that. That drifted by, didn't it? So I'm going to see if I can... I'll screen share his bench. So if you remember last, if you remember last week, the the, the ends, the, the sides are definitely different now. Um, actually, I don't know if there was ends last week. No, there were not. There were but no armrests. Now you can see that he has these ends in here, uh, armrests, the angled armrests, basically. Um, That's cool. But what's cool is how they are, the joinery there. So you see how that goes in? Uh, so that's that right, right through, is it? Well, it's hard to, it's hard to, where get in here, Andy? I've had a two um, Andy, um, heavy slab. Same 10 degree angle, side piece lost a significant amount of mass, which I think is great. I think it looks lighter, even though it's still a chunky bench, but I, I don't think it looks chunky. I just think it looks straight. Um, he's not sure about how those are going to be attached. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think it is um, pretty. If you don't. Like, if you don't remember, this is his first prototype that we had on last week. Yeah. Um, I'll show you the uh, the first line now. See, it had no no armrests basically, um, and the ends are the ends are significantly lighter now. So when we go back to the design. The ends are completely different. It's a com completely different. I think that looks great, actually. I think that's an improvement. It does, especially in this picture here, it does have a little bit of a... Um, and the only way I can say it is it almost, it's got a little bit of a, <clears throat> of a planter box feel. Okay. Yeah, I, I I get I get where you're coming from there. So yeah. that's that's there. Yeah, yeah. Almost like a long planter box. So I think the ends here add a really cool detail. So maybe there's a way. Maybe there's a way to take something from the ends and and uh, you know what would be cool is if how these armrests float above the base. Is if the back is if the or sorry the the ends the armrests float above the seat, is if the back floated above the seat. Yeah, I, I think that would that would make it um, give it some greater continuity. I like that idea, Matt. So you have this gap here, in the uh, in, in between the two back slats, you have the gap between the armrest and the back slats, and a gap between the armrest and the seat. I would echo that gap between the back slats and the seat, and even between the two seat slats, perhaps. But I think it's I think this is an improvement on his design, and I like how he's doing these prototypes. Um, when you zoom in on them, it's even hard to tell that they're... Um, Scale. Yeah, that they're small. Yeah, definitely. Was Andy not in the... Chat room here. He was. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop my. I'm gonna stop my screen share here. Did you okay. see the link I posted of the? Um, that your. Um, your bedside table reminded me of. Oh, I that. Um, drifted by, didn't click on it. 
Um, Here we go. So this is a this is from the Lost Art Press blog. Mm. But okay. um, three legged chair. And apparently it, they call it, it a famine chair. Okay. Is it the three legged part that reminded you of the it was chair? The three, or something it was else? the three legs. It was definitely the three okay. legs. Um, it was definitely the three three legs. But it's, I guess it's a Welsh design, but it's pretty rough. Um, I mean, you can see all the nicks, and the legs don't even really look uniform. And I think in the post he talks about how it had, um, at one time there were two or possibly three rear legs, and now it's down to one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and it might have been that there was. It might have been that they lost the legs, and then and when they lost it, they just moved a leg. But did I hear um, you say that there could have been two or three legs in the back? It says two or three rear legs here. Wow. Okay. So that'd be a five-legged ta- uh, chair in that case. Yeah. At one time, there were two or possibly three uh, rear legs. <laughs> Today they're called famine chairs, which is I think kind of interesting. So. Mm-hmm. So because you're starved for what? Uh, so you only built three legs? Table, well, the reason I asked if your table was a stool is because I thought that that could work as a bench. Hmm. Or, sorry, as a seat. As a seat, if it was shorter. so. If it was shorter, or if yeah. you were really tall. yeah. Or if you were really tall. I'm not, so no, I, don't, I. I don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. The hangout is giving me troubles again, so. Okay. Um. I've had no issues. That's been awesome. That's awesome. Uh, the whole um, whole thing. There was another so, project that Wood Toast was sharing. Uh, he had a scale build of an apartment. Uh, no, uh, not a scale. A life size, full scale. Um, life size diorama of a Le Corbusier apartment. At the Museum of Modern Art, so there it is. There, so it's life size. So those windows are full size. Everything's full size then, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's life sized. Now, okay. So at the Museum of Modern Art, is it a scaled down version of the apartment, and you're making a full sized one? Is that is that how you read that, Matt? I, from what I understand, it's. Um, basically recreating the apartment at the Museum of Modern Art so people can see what the apartment was like without having to travel to it. I believe. Hmm. Uh, I got a question on the the butternut table um, about (laughs) use of grain filler, whether I used grain filler, what finish I used, which is pretty good question. I'm surprised that nobody, nobody asked that so far. Um, I, did not, I did not need to use the grain filler on it. Um, I know that walnut's quite porous and you would think that butternut would also be quite porous because it is a relative to it, but I didn't, didn't find that to be the case at all with this butternut. It was actually quite quite dense. Really? Um, really, yeah. Um, I was surprised actually. Um, so I just sanded it. I well. It is a little bit soft, and there is a lot of varying densities, especially on the knot. So I plan- I hand planed it as far as I could go. Then um, I think I, I think I lightly sanded it with 220, and then I finished it with uh, orange shellac. Brushed? Um, uh, ragged on. Sprayed, sprayed on, and, and ragged on. That's what I did. Uh, quick build with spray and then finish with uh, rag. When you do the finish of the um, Enduro bar, mm-hmm. um, you've already put on a first coat of that, right? I put on five coats. Oh, five coats. So which you, is are probably you ragging that on? I'm brushing it on. Oh, brushing um, it's it. very difficult to rag on finish to live edges, so I brush it on. You don't spray, do you? I do. Okay. Um, why didn't you shellac it and then do Enduro Bar? Did you just decide to go with the same finish the whole way through? 
for the for the table for the uh, for this table with the glass top. Yeah, the one that you're putting the the one that you put the five coats of enduro bar on already. Um, I don't have uh, de-wax shellac, and I didn't want to de-wax the shellac sure. I have. Okay. Uh, key. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Finish yeah. wouldn't stick up on the waxing stuff, so. No. no. Cool. So, when finishing the live edge, what are the, what are some of the other concerns? Um, you need to some of the some, sometimes there are crevices that need to be finished, and that's part of why I use a brush. I like to use um, I use a foam brush with the enduro bar, water based. It's nice and easy. Um, you might also use a synthetic bristle brush. Um, with the foam brushes, I find that they they hold a lot of finish, so I can kind of squeeze them out over top of a um, a crevice, if you will, mm -hmm. and I can let the finish drip down into there. Um, I make sure it doesn't build up in there and dry in a blob, though. Um, yeah. Uh, foam brushes are cheap, so if, if they tear on the live edges, it's not a big deal. Um, brushes would avoid that. Um, I, d I do like the foam brushes, though. So. That's interesting, because I hate foam brushes. Do you? I always feel like I get little pieces of little tiny pieces of black from the foam brush in yeah. the finish. Maybe I'm just using uh, cheap ones, but um, what finishes are you using? Yeah, it's in shellac. Oh, it's, been, it's been so much, so long since I've used them. I don't even know. Okay, it is all in shellac and lacquer. Okay. And yeah, yeah, mine was, I never, I wouldn't have used shellac and lacquer with them. It would have been either, it would have been a, either a water base, uh, poly, mm -hmm. or an oil varnish. Oil varnish blend. Well, okay. oil varnish blend. Mineral spirits probably would have done it, but I, I'm not sure. Maybe. I'm not sure if that would dissolve a, a foam brush. Or a wiper on her. So was that a question for me? No, I was just saying I spray or I wipe on. Okay. Oh, okay. So let's see what is Andy Brownell posting? Ah, Andy posted his mox and vice. Okay. So what was your question about mocks and vices, Chris? <laughs> Who has one? <laughs> um, I've got one. I've been using it for about a year. Um, I have a Tucker vice as well, a pattern maker's vice. Yep. And after, um, after I went to Woodworking in America and I was working at Shannon's um, joinery bench, um, I kind of started liking the mocks and the mocks and style, and that twin screw it kind of intrigued me. Yeah. Um, so I came back and I built my own uh, joinery bench and I put on a, um, a mock style twin screw with uh, wooden screws that I made myself. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to evaluate it to see how it works, how it performs, and what it's good for, what it's not so good for, as compared to the pattern maker's vice, which I absolutely loved. So mm -hmm. I took off that vice and I, I took off the pattern maker's vice and I've been using this uh, mock. Uh, vice for uh, about a year, exclusively for a year, and um, there was one improvement, one big improvement that I found, and I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, one of the magazines I write write for, um, Canadian Woodworking, mm -hmm. they published their entire magazine online, which is, I think, kind of crazy. Um, Do you need a subscription? You do not. Um, able to just follow this link I'm going to drop into Twitter here. If I can put it properly. And um, you, sh you should be able to read every single I um, article in the issue, which I think is pretty cool, but I don't see how they make money. Um, anyhow, well, there is an article. A lot of ads. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, maybe they make their ads that way. So this is where that link will take you. June, July 2013. Bigger. And scroll down, look at your articles here, some of them. And hey, look at that, build a mox and vice. Just keep the link. Yep. And it's an article by somebody else about um, his, his account of building a vice. He bought... Uh, the Acme threads elsewhere, and he saved a bunch of money as opposed to buying the um, bench crafted set. Mm -hmm. 
He said it was $155 for the Benchcrafted kit uh, versus buying the hardware for $18. Mm -hmm. So keep going down and this is ice there just to clamp on tight. But um, the part I want to show you is an improvement that I came up with on the vise. Um, one of the downsides to the vise is that when you clamp a thin piece of material towards the top, anything that doesn't protrude um, past the midpoint of the threads, yeah, um, it wants to rack vertically. So the bottom of the jaw will will scoot in, and it's difficult to hold things that way. So the simple uh, modification, what I did is I cut two um, U-shaped supports that you see here, just with a slot big enough to take a, a screw, mm -hmm. the, the shaft of a screw, a clearance hole size slot. And I attach them to the bottom of the workbench, they slide in and out. When I want to, to clamp a narrower piece of stock, I slide them forward and I put a scrap piece on top of those supports, then I can clamp that other piece on top. Gotcha. And the beautiful thing about it, when I take out my scrap piece and the other piece, I, when I cr crank the vise closed, it pushes in these supports automatically. So that's my solution to what is probably the biggest uh, weakness of this vise style, which is actually one of the few weaknesses. Yeah. Um, those must be dog holes, I guess. Yeah, those yes. are dog holes. Yeah, yeah, there's dogs sticking through there. It's kind of it's kind of like the same thing you get with a um, crap. No, I can't think of it. The other vice where you have to do the pin in the leg. Uh, leg vice. Yeah, leg vice. That's why it's called a leg. For God's sake. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah, it, so yeah. the the moxum will rack a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, yeah. It'll rack as much as he let it. Um. Okay. How did you cut the uh, the woodens? Did you use the 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 uh, threader that you have to turn by hand, and then the the or did you um, use the one that use a, uses a router? I used the router version, the Beal. Um, this did is. That work well. Uh, I did, yeah. Pretty simple. Um, this is the vice here. Um, can't remember if I have any pictures of cutting the threads, but um, I drilled holes for you drill clearance holes in the chop, the front jaw of the vice, mm -hmm. for the threads, and I elongated mine quite a bit so I can clamp stuff with uh, quite a skewed jaw like you see here, which is quite useful. Um, the video here. Oh, what's the advantage of a box of vice over a twin screw vice where you can turn one handle and the two screws turn? Uh, like the, um, a chain driven type? Yeah. Like the With, I think Lee Valley has one or Lee Nielsen has one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple. These are faster to operate. Yeah. Um, there's less resistance between the nuts and the threads, so you can actually spin them. I'm sure you've seen the be Benchcrafted video. Yep. Um, and the other advantage is the amount you can skew the jaw. Um, oh, yeah, for a regular work. The, yeah, the Lee Nielsen one you can't skew at all, as far as I know, mm -hmm. and the Veritas one you can skew maybe one or two rotations, which is not very much at all. Yeah. Stop. Um, this one you can see I can skew. This is as far as I can skew it. I've got about uh, three and a quarter, three and a half inches of skew yeah. over the length. And the stuff I do that is kind of useful. So the three, yeah, okay, I got it, I got it. The the jaw of the vise is loose. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And it's threaded into the bench. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And yours is not mounted to the top. Yours is not the kind that you mount to the top. It yours is mounted right into the bench face. Mine's integral. That's right. Yeah. 
I like that. Mm -hmm. I've been really happy with the vice. Um, as far as to um, the pattern maker's vice, it's almost as versatile, almost as good. Um, it doesn't cost seven hundred dollars, um, which the the Tucker did. Um, for most woodworkers, it's probably just as good a vice. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a few other features. Wood one. Mm -hmm. There's a few other features of the Tucker vise which are really good and that this won't touch the uh, moxen, but there are pretty few cases where you would need that and even fewer where you can't have a workaround using hand screws or clamps or some other technique. Mm -hmm. Um. So Jim is asking, Jim's mentioning that he hasn't worked with live edge um, lumber before or slabs before. He's got a bar top okay. that, that's, that was in the house when he bought it. Mm -hmm. um, when you're building these tables for the tabletops, I imagine on these slabs there's lots of recesses. Yeah, they, under, they right. undulate quite a bit. Yeah. Are you going to uh, fill those with epoxy and then do a film finish? Or are you going to leave them? I usually just leave them. Yeah. Um, if they're in the surface of the table where they'll attract um, just stuff where you, you, you want to keep just it clean, debris, then I'll like fill them. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. yeah, then I'll fill them. Okay. Um, if that's not an issue, I won't, I won't fill them for the most part. We should yeah, do a I, feature. I imagine that... Um, if you have somebody who's having you build it as a conference room table, they're going to want to write on it, so they're going to want it smooth. So, uh, possibly, or they may, or, um, or, or they could use some um, just write, write on books or pads of paper. Um, yeah. yeah. It would depend on, I think it would be a personal preference thing. Yeah. What other concerns are there, like when you're working with a big slab like that? Hurting your back. Um. Yeah, hurting your back is one. Um. Ruining all your friendships because you're always making people uh, yeah. haul big, heavy things for you? Yeah. Um, movements can be a concern. You have to design a little bit differently because you are working with a single slab and it's usually flat sawed. Yeah. Um, we should do a future woodshed on on live edge work or slab yeah, work or both. Big slabs and One of each. I think a lot of people, right? Don't even know where to get slabs right now. Well, yeah. Um, you've got a lot of people ask me. Secret stash, but. Yes, yes. Um, get in, get in, make friends with your local sawyer. That's my best advice. My best advice for any woodworker. Um, I remember once I, once I met this guy, and once I started getting wood, I became less frugal with all my wood. I was more free to create, more free to experiment. I wasn't concerned about. Yeah. I wasn't as concerned about messing up this piece of wood, which I, which I had to buy S for S for. Yeah. Five dollars yeah. a linear foot for. Yeah. It, it, it is an investment to 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 buy the material and get it dried. There's people who don't want to waste their wood, right? And so they're they're. Yeah. And that I think, I think the investment in in the wood, sometimes, means that people. It can keep them from experimenting. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Which is a, um, like like Andy does. Then you can t go experiment with uh, small scale and work what you design that way too. What you can do as I do and just make it up with a uh, big scale. Yeah. Whichever works for you. So you probably won't be filling those those with uh, epoxy? No, not likely. Um, only only if it's a function, if it affects the fun function, then I will fill. Yeah. yeah. Same goes with cracks and splits. Um, if it affects the, the uh, function, then I'll fill them. So Dale does a lot of butterflies. That's right, yes. He does some pretty cool ones. He does. Do you do any butterflies? I do. Um, I don't use them too often. 
And when I do, I use them uh, con conservatively, usually. Um, actually, on this uh, rook bench that I built, um, with that mox advice, I have a couple um, dovetail keys in there. Mm -hmm. Dovetail keys, Dutchman, butterflies, they're all the same thing, right? Yeah. Where did that go? I don't know where that article is. Um, I've got pictures of that somewhere in here. There's the vice. Have you ever used uh, here. Like, uh, steel rods pulled through and, and bolted on either end? I have it. Do you have dovetails in here yet? I don't think I do. So it's just. No, I did that later. Okay, never mind. No pictures of the dovetails there. Okay. So, um, Matt, did you want to share your, your project? No. I can't find yeah. the damn pictures. Okay, all right. So, um, over the next two Wednesdays, um, I'm taking a seminar on. A two-part seminar, two-day seminar on um, making a cigar box guitar. Oh no way! You guys seen those before? Yes. Where where, uh, where are you doing this at? Hey, at uh, the local Lee Valley. <laughs> are you do, are you teaching it? No, I'm not. No, no. It seems like a fun fun project. It's something I've always wanted to build. A, I've wanted to build a guitar for a while, but. Um, uh, it's just building an acoustic guitar from scratch. It's a lot of, I don't know, it seems quite unfamiliar to me. And while well, I'm not really afraid of it, unfamiliar, when it has to function in the level that a guitar does, that's a little, Yeah. Uh, that's a big step. So I think this is a good place to start. Um, we'll, I'm not sure how big the class is, maybe... Uh, ten people or so will be building uh, these guitars, um, That's very cool. and the the sound the sound box is um, an, a, a cigar box. There you go, just a name. Is it a real cigar box, or are you building a cigar box? I believe they are real cigar boxes. That's very cool. So I don't know, but um, Matthias Wandel just made a ukulele. Okay. Um, but Grizzly sells ukulele kits, and I've got a couple of those. I'm going to make one for my daughter, so we'll That's see how it goes. Nice. Is that coming up in the near future? I hope so. I hope I get some. Um, I hope I get some shop time soon. I haven't been getting a lot of shop time lately. Yeah. Um, I did a pro. I did a very simple project for a customer. Um, over the weekend, but it was it was it was. It was literally just milling some boards. So that's all it was. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, this seminar just happens to be um, next two Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Okay. So you won't be here for wood chat the next two Wednesdays. That's correct. And the third well, Wednesday, I'll, I'll play you a song and say I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, we have a new user. Do you have pictures? JHO Studios just made some four stools with four steel stools. bases and tops made from one walnut slab with live edge. I can I can picture that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, last week, um, Todd Butler sent me some pictures of a uh, coffee Butler table, which he's yeah. Um, sent me pictures of this table. Which he was was working on. Um, I'll share some links here. What is going um, on with the top of that table? You'll see in a minute. Um, so it has a uh, steel base, and it's got a slab top, and it's got. Some nice blue painters tape all over it and some stuff on top. 
and that stuff on top is there's no picture of it. I thought there was a picture at Stale's table. Um, it's epoxy. He's filling voids or knots with epoxy. I thought there was okay. a picture, here, but I could be mistaken. So from the skewed picture I'm looking at, it looks like um, what I'll call lo like large worm damage or beetle yeah. damage. Okay, so oh, there's butterflies in there too. Yeah, so. So this picture here shows the uh, voids, the cracks, which he has... Mm -hmm. um, put dovetail keys through, and I think this is also what he's filling with epoxy. Gotcha. And this would then be the other side of the slab. Nice piece of um, walnut, I think it would be. This is okay. So this is actually the bottom. It has a smaller cracks, and this is the top before the epoxy was added. Yeah. So that'll look quite nice when it's done. Yeah, it will. It will. The table looked bigger in the pictures. The tabletop looked, tabletop looked bigger when it was on the steel in front of the couch. Hmm. Now I'm realizing that it's, yeah. it's uh, not, very, not very deep. It's looking about two feet by four and yeah. a half, five feet. Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, I would love to be able to build stuff like that by myself. Yeah. Who's got an MFT? Count this. Measure the dis distance in the hole so we can figure out the size of it here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, three inches, three, six. Yeah, about two feet, maybe a bit over two feet is my guess. So that's uh, Todd's table. Um, you can find him on Twitter at, at uh, TBDI. So the butler did it, 0629. So that was his table. And Dale's also got a table in the works. Um, he sent me this picture last week. Um, he's got one of his creative butterflies. You can see spanning that gap. And I'm um, not sure what he's doing here. I guess he's drilling a hole for the base. That's an awfully big job right there. Well, that is that. Oh, I would invite you guys to come check out uh, my new gallery too. I've updated it and I've been updating it, adding past projects that are aren't available, and it's in a nice, easy to see format. Um, the black and white images are items that are sold and not for sale, and the color ones are available, so it's easy to navigate. You can see. Um, the work that I've done in the past quite easily get an idea of what I've done and what's still available and it also gives you an idea of how my style has progressed and I found that especially interesting going back through the archives of past projects it's yeah. uh, all chronological there how are the sales going? Um, they're pretty good um, they're not, I don't know, that's a tough question to answer. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to have more sales, but I'm happy with the number that I have as well. More, more this year than last year? Um, I, I would, I've sold, I've sold more spec stuff this year. Um, as far as more orders for spec and commission combined, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I have to have to check the records for that one, Matt. Let's see. I would guess yes, but um, I'm not sure. I think I might have found the stools. Okay. But I'm not sure that these are the right stools. No, they're not. Oh, 
I think, yeah. Um, I'm envisioning something similar to Todd's, where it has a, a square metal base, and it's got, yeah, maybe call it a four foot by one foot slab cut into one foot section, so each is square, and it's yeah. sitting on top of the, the metal base. That's what I'm envisioning. Okay, found him. I believe I found him. Good. Yes, I did find them. Okay, here we go. Okay. So let me screen share these. Can you see that? I can see that, yes. So he had a local welder do the steel bases, and from what I can see, that welder did a good job of grinding out all the joints. Wow. Oh, that, that, that is cool. See how the three of them fit together like a wave? And they look seamless, too, when they're together. Yes. They fit together very good. I wish their gallery would let me click next, but it's a one-at-a-time gallery. Live edge, uh, and you can see that this is one continuous piece of wood, right? When you follow the grain, that's very well done. And it looks like the legs have a splay to them. Yeah, they definitely do. This will be a good picture here. Uh, splay to the sides, and maybe the back legs are splayed out as well, maybe? Mm -hmm. That's a very, very cool. Very cool. There's some leg detail. See how, clean, nice see how, see how clean the um, the welds are? That's pretty cool. Let's see here for the better leg angle, leg angle detail. You can kind of tell in this picture that there's an angle there to the legs. I like the contrast between the metal, the, the black metal and the uh, live edge. Uh, yeah, and I like how the metal's not too the metal's not too heavy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very well done. Like it a lot. Like it a lot. Would you say that's a three quarter inch uh, square stock? I think it is. Yeah, um, I think that's three quarter inch. And it looks like just flat bar between them, which yep. um, keeps the design light. I like that, John. It's good. I think those are pretty darn pretty darn nice. Well, Chris, we are past time. All right. So we should probably wrap it up. So you won't be here next week or the week after. That is correct, unless uh, something changes. A, will you be doing a blog update uh, that we can look at during WoodChat? Sure, I can do that. Beautiful. We'll do that. Um, um, are you going to do a I recording guess. of you playing your cigar? <laughs> um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll dub in some music as I strum. It's a good idea, man. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll learn. Um, we'll see. Cool. Um, well, you won't see an up. You won't see an update, obvi um, obviously, next week because I'll, that'll be the first day when I'm building. So maybe the week after, I'll I'll get an update. Well, of, we can uh, get the an update class. on your table. We can get an update on your slabs you're working on. You can absolutely. Cool. All right, folks. Well, that's it for wood chat for uh, May twenty second, twenty thirteen. Uh, it was a design jam. Um, we do this, we do WoodChat every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern over at uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom. This week and last week we did a design jam where people shared their projects. Some people asked for feedback, and you can see from um, Andy Brownell, he uh, took some of the feedback from WoodChat and, and changed the design of his, uh, of his bench in pretty cool ways. Um, next week we don't have a topic yet. Chris won't be here, but we'll decide on a topic and get the invites out here pretty soon. Chris, you want to say goodbye since you won't see anybody for a couple of weeks here, three weeks? Goodbye, everybody. I'll miss you. Good luck with your, good luck with your project, your uh, cigar box guitar, Chris. Thank you, Matt. All right, everybody. That's it. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. See ya.